that's worshipped a lot today.
service into your hands, Lord, and Lord, I pray that you speak to each and every one of us and we'll have a blessed service and, and a blessed week ahead, oh Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, Amen. This morning we want to pray for all the people who are born in the month of July. And, uh, I want to speak Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 to you. Praise be to the God and Father of Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Father, we want to thank you for all those who are born in the month of July. We want to bless them. That your word say that we bless with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus, Lord. We ask God to continue to bestow upon them the wisdom from on high, and to bestow upon them health, and wisdom, and grace, and strength to come upon them. And then as we celebrate their birthday in the month of July, we bless them. We, uh, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. This morning we will have. Uh, associate Minister, Sister Josephine, done to come and share the word of God with us this morning. Let's just welcome Sister Josephine. Good morning. Shalom to all of you. Today, I want to talk about how to live out the Christian life of faith according to the word of God. In this time of pandemic, our world has changed. Many have suffered and more will be affected in the near future when the second pandemic hits because many plans and livelihood are disrupted. In the midst of all these, the most common advice we hear, especially among Christians, is trust in the Lord, have faith in Jesus. My question is, is trusting the Lord alone sufficient? Christians need to understand who Jesus is and what it means to trust and believe in Him. Dr. Charles Stanley has said that most Christians today can be divided into two categories, those who follow the world and those who follow Christ. Those who follow the world are very much influenced by the many wisdoms and philosophies of this world, while those who follow Christ are made complete through their persistent faith in Jesus. Yes, we are bombarded every day by the worldly perspective all the time, telling us how and why we must live in certain ways, do certain things or do this and do that in order to find fulfillment and achievement in life. But can we find true fulfillment in all these of efforts offered by the world? Let's look at how, what, let's look at our world today. What is it like? Isaiah 60 tells us that the world, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. Yes! The world gets darker and darker outwardly and the inward hearts of men fall even lower and lower. This is the actual scenario of today's generation. And worldly wisdom and philosophies that influence so much mostly stem from such a world like this. As Christians, we battle every day we are in the struggle between following the world's way or God's way and the constant conflict of fulfilling the desires of our carnal nature of the old man or the desire of the new creation in Christ. Christians need to remind ourselves we are different from those in the world. We are supposed to be set apart. 
We live in this world, but we are not of this world. In fact, Hebrew 11 reminds us that we are merely strangers and pilgrims on earth. And our destination should be the city which has foundation and built by God. We should desire a better place prepared by God. Our final destination is definitely not of this world. So, what must Christian do to live out this journey of faith on earth? Well, the author of Hebrew tells us to look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Yes, all we need is Jesus and Christ alone is sufficient. We only need to live faithfully according to the will of God and let Jesus be lifted up among all the world wisdom and philosophies. However, this seems easier said than done. How do we go about working out this life of faith on earth? Well, God didn't leave us in the dark. Hebrew 12 provides the guideline for us. How do we live out in this life? Let's read Hebrew 12 verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Here, the author of Hebrew uses a race metaphor and describe Christian life as a race. Christian life is likened to a race set before every believer of Jesus. All Christians are like the athlete, expected to run and complete the race of faith set before them. God has mapped out a specific course for every believer. This course includes victories and defeats, sufferings and persecutions, all kinds of trials and testing. Like those witnesses who are surrounding us, they have completed their own race and they are found faithful by God. As recorded in Hebrews chapter 11, Moses had his race to run. Joseph had his race to run too. And we too have our own unique race to run. My race will not be like yours. My struggle may not be your struggle. We are not to compete with one another, but to complete our own race. However, finishing well is crucial because it has eternal consequences and rewards. According to the Hebrews 12, verse uh, 1 and 2, to complete the race, we have to work on four important guidelines which I have listed out. We have to labour and work out our faith by doing these four things. Laying aside every weight and sin that clings on us. Let us run with endurance. Let us focus on Jesus and let us consider the reward. We will look at it one by one. The first action we must work on is laying aside every weight and sin. The author asks Christians when we run the race, we have to lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely to us. We need to be light when we are running a race. But the word weight here refers to anything that hinders the runner's progress. Hence, weight can be understood as hindrances or any excessive weight, body weight of the runner. So Christians, we are advised to throw away 
anything that prevents them from running the race of fate. Scholars have identified this weight as anything which may be perfectly all right in their own way, but hinders the progress of the race of faith. Every spiritual runner, every Christian must find out for yourself what your weight or hindrances is. Uh -uh. What could we possibly what could possibly be the weight that hinders our race of faith on earth? John Calvin, the famous theologian, says that these can be the various burdens of life which can directly affect our relationship with God. His list of burdens includes love of this present life, the pleasure of this world, the lust of the flesh, worldly cares and riches and honours, hence, whosoever run in this course prescribed by Jesus must first throw away all these hindrances. Of course, he didn't mean Christians must cast away their riches and blessing of life unless these become the hindrances and slow down their spiritual race. So all of us, should search our hearts and identify our own kinds of weight or hindrances. It can be easily be our hobbies, our lifestyles, our values, or even our habits. So, check ourselves. Do we have any weight that affect our spiritual growth and relationship with God? A weight is not a sin. It is just a hindrance. For example, a weight can be anything that hinders you or me from carrying out our calling or doing God's will. It is something non-essential, not important to our mission or calling, but it consumes so much of our time and energy that could have been better used in advancing God's kingdom. These weights differ from one believer to another. A good example will be spending too much time watching TV or playing handphone instead of reading God's word and spending time with God. Whatever it might be, it is something that threatens our relationship with God and prevents us from fulfilling God's will. We should also lay aside sin in our life in order to run the race well. The sin refers here is the besetting sin that persistently cling on to us closely. It is the sin in our own life that we ourselves know very well and quite likely noticed by others too. The common ones would be lying and cheating, complaining and grumbling, doubt and unbelief, greed and covetousness, self-centeredness, prideful, addiction, idolatry in our hearts, etc, etc. The list can go on. We need to deal with these sins. If we don't cut loose this besetting sin, it will entangle us and it will weigh us down in our race. Anything that will slow us down or trip us must be cast off. The Apostle Paul advised us in Ephesians 4, put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And when we must deal with these sins, so how do we deal with this sin? Paul in Romans 6 has taught us how to deal with sin. By having faith in Jesus, we are to realize that we are dead to sin. We should know that our old self was crucified with Christ and consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to Christ. We should present ourselves to God as an instrument of righteousness and not 
instruments of unrighteousness because sin no longer has dominion over us as we are now under grace. Having said that, we must realize that the laying aside of sin is a long, lifelong process. It involves obedience to the word of God and dying to self. We should generally desire to let go of all these weights and sin that hinders our race. We can cut this sin loose when we hold on to Jesus. The second guideline for us to complete the race is to run with endurance. Hebrews uh, 12 verse 2 Verse 1, ask us to run the race with endurance. There is no shortcut. Even Jesus himself had to endure his race. The word endurance implies the nature of the run is prolonged and much effort is needed to complete. This race is not a sprint, but a long-distance marathon. A marathon is a strenuous fitness a test of fitness and endurance. The race of faith set before Christian requires faith, stamina, commitment and discipline in order to live faithfully. Since the race is marked out by God, we have no choice. We have to stay on the course in spite of trials, suffering and persecution. In short, Christians are called to remain faithful to the end. Apostle Paul understood these principles very well and he said this uh, towards the end of his life. In, Timoth in 2 Timothy verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 7, Paul said that, I have fought this good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. This is truly a race of endurance. The next guideline for completing the race is in verse 2. We are asked to focus on Jesus. In the context of a race, the attention of every Christian athlete must be directed towards the finishing line. When we are asked to look to Jesus, it simply means we are to turn away from other distractions and direct our eyes to Jesus alone. It is impossible to look into two directions at one time. Hence, we cannot be looking at the world while we are running this race of faith. Christians are challenged to look away from things which distract and look intently upon Jesus. By looking into Jesus, we obtain support, encouragement, and inspiration. Jesus is the best example of manhood. His attitude and his action at the cross can encourage us to persevere and endure till the end of the race of faith. Jesus, who is the incarnate God, understands our weaknesses. So, this will help us to identify readily with Jesus' humility and obedience unto death as man. When our eyes are on Jesus, we can lay aside and overcome those things that hinder us from coming to a full and mature relationship with God. Jesus is the founder and the perfecter of our faith. He is not only the pioneer of Christian faith to believers from the first century onwards until now, but he is also the pioneer who leads those faithful men and women before he was born, like Abraham and Moses and Rahab. They were all inspired and believed in the coming Messiah. It is Jesus who has led all these people of God through his incarnation, through his crucifixion and resurrection into the path of faith 
and ultimately he lead all of us to heaven. Jesus is the one who made our faith perfect. Through his once and for all offering of himself to God, he was the perfect sacrifice for the atonement of our sin. Jesus was made perfect through the suffering and the obedience at the cross. It was Jesus' faith in God that carried him through the ordeal of crucifixion. Jesus has brought this faith to perfection by his endurance at the cross. Through this, he obtained perfection for all of his followers. His perfection has inaugurated a new and living way for men to return to God. Salvation or saving faith is a gift from God through Christ. Jesus is also the sustainer of our faith. Hebrews 6.25 tells us that Jesus, the great high priest, always lives to make intercession for us. He will watch over our faith, especially in times of our doubt and spiritual struggle. And, and Paul in Philippians 1 tells us that Jesus, who has begun a good work in you and me, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is great comfort that Jesus not only initiated the faith in us, but he watches over us and he will see to it that we complete our race of faith. Let us look at the next guideline. How did Jesus endure the ordeal at the cross? This leads us to the next guideline, which is focusing on the rewards. Hebrew 12 verse 2 tells us that for the joy set up for him, Jesus endured the cross. This regarding is shame and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. This statement links joy to suffering. Jesus was motivated by the joy set for him to suffer on the cross. Biblical scholars believe that the joy mentioned here refers to the joy Jesus spoke in the upper room with his disciple before his passion. The joy that was set before Jesus is something not for himself alone, but to be shared with those for whom he died and those who believe in him. It is the joy of reconciling lost sinners back to God, bringing glory to the Father. This joy is the reward that caused Jesus to look beyond the shame and suffering at the cross. Jesus despised the shame brought about by the crucifixion, the worst form of execution, uh, the worst form of criminal uh, execution. Jesus has set the supreme example of endurance for those suffering Christians so that they can imitate him and disregard the adversity and the pain and suffering they encounter. And they can dwell in the hope of the promises of the new covenant brought about by Jesus through his work at the cross. So Christians endure like Jesus in whatever trials and persecution so that we may enjoy the promises of God in glory. In a conclusion, I would like to look into this. The book of Hebrew is actually written to a group of Jews who were facing persecution and tempted to turn back to Judaism and renounce Christ. Similarly, similar problems are facing believers today because the world we have left behind when we become the children of God, it is still there. This world is still there and calling to us, wanting us to go back to the old way of life. But we are now running a race and we should not backtrack but keep moving forward 
we have to intentionally resist all these temptation, deal with the weights and sins in our life diligently. Many of us are struggling with this temptation and persecution from the world. Many started well but didn't finish the race because they went on their own way instead of God's way. Instead of following Christ, they followed the world. They don't run the race of God intended for them, but they choose to run their own race. They have fallen into the temptation of this world and gone on a detour and sometimes going round and round into the wilderness. Some of them have even lost their way and don't know how to come back to the cause. Let us humble ourselves and examine our lives and see if there were any weights and sin that we mentioned earlier that have hindered us, entangled us and caused us to lose sight of Jesus. Remember, our Lord is always there waiting for us to make the U-turn and come back to the cause to continue the race. And if we encounter challenging situation that brings pain and suffering, that make us weary and faint-hearted, don't just dwell on the suffering of the difficult circumstances. By faith, let us look to the promises of God and receive strength, peace, joy and abundant blessing that this world cannot offer. Look past the challenge and the hardship and the suffering and see the promises of inheritance from the kingdom of God. Remember, we are only on this earth for a while. We must get ready for heaven. To conclude, I would like to urge you to take this message seriously. Let us be the true follower of Jesus and not the follower of the world. Let us run the race of faith with endurance, laying aside and dealing with all the hindrances and besetting sin that slow us down and focus unto Jesus who is the perfect example so that we can receive the glorious reward from above. So let us look unto Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith and complete whatever the Lord asks us to do. I would like to pray for all of you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this timely message that remind us to continue to persevere in our race of faith on earth. Thank you for understanding our weaknesses. We ask for your strength and wisdom to guide us on the journey of faith. We ask for your grace and mercy to keep us on the path of righteousness so that we may be counted as faithful before you one day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.